Um, I stood before this group about five years ago in Santa Monica, um, then the soon departed chairman of the board of JAMS to talk about the business of mediation, commercial success of mediation in the United States and other countries. I felt I had something to offer in that regard. But I observed at the end of that conference and the end of my talk, really a call to action. And based on the, the concept that as successful commercial mediators, some with 20 or 30 years of experience in the industry, uh, we were in danger of, of complacency. And that really, complacency was sort of the kryptonite to our ability to move forward in this business and really inspire the next generation of people who come behind us. And it's been five years uh, since that conversation. Uh, the world is seemingly, at times, a darker, more foreboding place. Um, and maybe the, the call for us to look for ways to expand our skills uh, is even louder, even more needed. Um, and that's really what fits so nicely in uh, John's program and the IMA's effort uh, here at Edinburgh is to try and have a conversation about ways that we as successful commercial mediators can take our skills and apply them in a universe of, of conflicts, societal conflicts, be they local or regional or national, um, because there's, there's never been a more important time and there's never been a more skilled group uh, to be able to contemplate that challenge. So well, today we're going to renew that conversation over the next 90 minutes. Uh, whether that conversation takes us to examples of uh, some of the things that are happening in the United States where people are uh, organizing uh, living room conversations amongst neighbors uh, who have disparate views on important issues, uh, or uh, as uh, John and his contemporaries were talking about this morning, the, the bus operator who was here talking about important conversations uh, designed around uh, bus rides, um, or broader conversations about uh, tackling problems. Uh, Daniel Bowling is a friend of ours in the uh, IAM. He's not uh, here in Scotland with us, but I know back home he's doing important work uh, in some of our uh, <coughs> local communities with uh, getting government entities together around homeless problems and trying to better the lives of many uh, who are homeless in our community. So we're going to talk not just with our guests who I'm going to introduce momentarily, but in groups and amongst ourselves in the next 90 minutes to try and stimulate a conversation about what we can do to extend uh, the universe of our efforts. And if there's a, if there's a gallon left or, or a liter left in the tank uh, for many of us, uh, how are we going to tap into that and fuel our energy as we look for the same type of creative ideas and thought leadership and passion that drove many of us to this uh, in the first instance 30 years ago and have got us to this moment in time. So where we go from here, how we continue to be inspired, and how we look to uh, apply these talents in a different context is really the subject of our conversation. And that's enough for me by way of introduction because we really have a delightful guest, and I think uh, I'd like to spend a few minutes introducing her and letting you get to meet the person that I've only recently met, but I think uh, you'll find her to be both delightful and informative. So let me get on with that. So this is Dr. Elworthy, and I am going to start by just uh, reading a paragraph from a recent book, acknowledging her credentials, and it will be uh, but a sampling of the things that she has done within her life, some of which I hope to draw upon in our ensuing conversation. Uh, Dr. Elworthy is a PhD. She's a three-time Nobel Peace Prize nominee for her work with Oxford Research Group, to develop effective dialogue between nuclear weapons policymakers worldwide and their critics, work which includes a series of meetings between Chinese, Russian, and Western nuclear scientists and military. She founded Peace Direct in, 20, in 2002 to fund, promote, and learn from local peace builders in conflict areas. Peace Direct was voted Best New Charity in 2005. And Sula was awarded the Nuwano Peace Prize in 2003, was advisor to Peter Gabriel, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and Sir Richard Branson in setting up the elders. Sula co-founded Rising Women, Rising World in 2013, and FemQ in 2016 to establish the qualities of feminine intelligence for women and men as essential to use in building a safer world. Her TED Talks on nonviolence have been viewed by over a million people, and her latest book, The Business Plan for Peace, 
uh, is uh, been introduced by uh, no less than uh, the Dalai Lama. And I have a hard time getting my wife to preview my blogs. So, uh, <laughs> testament to the Dalai Lama is credit to the message contained in the book. But with that introduction, I would like to uh, welcome our guests. Dr. Elwood, can you give us a sense of how you arrived at this moment in time? I know that's a broad question, but, but how did you find your way into the peace building world? And was it an epiphany in one moment, or was it a gradual confluence of, of sort of life circumstances that brought you here? Well, I think I was one of those lucky people who had no choice. Um, I was 13, sitting in my parents' living room and watching a grainy old black and white TV in 1956, when the Soviet tanks were rolling into Budapest and mowing down kids not very much older than me. And um, I was so shocked by what was happening that I rushed upstairs to pack my suitcase. And my mother came up and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to Budapest. <laughs> and I had no idea where Budapest was. And she said, what for? And I said, there's something so horrible happening there that I have to go. And she said, don't be so silly as mothers did in those days. And I burst into tears. And bless her, she got it. She got how important this was for me. I was only 13. It was just pure, strong emotion. And she said, listen, you're too young to be any use. Uh, if you just unpack your suitcase, I will see to it that you get trained. And she did. And what did that training look like to a 13 year old? Well, she sent me at 16 to work in a camp for uh, known as displaced persons, but mostly survivors of concentration camps. And I sat during the summer peeling potatoes, listening to the stories of what had happened to people in Auschwitz when I was 13. Uh, and then I went to work in camps for Vietnamese refugees and in an orphanage in Algiers and then in moving through the Congo in the middle of the civil war and so on. So it was it was an education. What are some of your memories from those early lessons that you've carried forward in life? I don't think I knew it then, Bruce, but what I think I've learned gradually is the formidable importance and usefulness of listening. And I noticed in our conversation earlier what a good listener you are. And uh, I do believe that really intently giving someone else our full attention is a very large part of uh, enabling the relationship to develop. An important part of our conversation I want to come back to shortly. Um, what are some of the early challenges you faced getting into this uh, peace building? I hate the word space because it's so sort of uh, diminishing, but uh, to get into this life endeavor, what are some of the challenges that you confronted that are most noted, personal or institutional? Well, I was, uh, I was living in South Africa and married to a South African, and, um, and uh, he gave me the opportunity to go back to university, so I did and learned Zulu. And that was the first breakthrough in my actual understanding of what was happening in South Africa. As, as a fairly secluded white person, I was completely unaware of the depth of what was happening. So that was a huge learning for me, to be able to go into the so-called homelands and actually hear people and for them to speak with me in their language. So you learned the language and you <laughs> became involved culturally yeah, at that level. That's right. And, um, and it was a series of, of big shocks. And on the back of it, having the wherewithal to decide what I could do to, to, to help, which was to work for a a nutrition education organization, enabling people to grow their own food and to use their very meager means to, to feed their families. So You've done a lot of work in the area of peace building, a lot in the area of nuclear disarmament. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine the types of challenges that you've run into, and the types of personal perseverance you've had to, to tap into to um, 
move in that direction. Talk about that a little bit. What uh, what were some of those challenges? Where did you find the strength to move forward? Well, I, I had to face my own drivers first. Um, in 1982, I became fearful and angry about the buildup of nuclear weapons worldwide, not just in the superpowers. And um, I became convinced that a nuclear war was likely. And in fact, in 1983, as many of you will know, we were actually 20 minutes away from a Soviet-American nuclear war by the misreading of an incoming radar signal in Moscow, which turned out to be a flock of geese. Um, and so I, I was driven to want to do something. I wanted to render the process of nuclear weapons policy making accountable and, and more transparent. Because in, in Britain, I don't know about in the States at the time, but in Britain, a, nuclear, a new nuclear development was simply announced in Parliament once it was a fact. You couldn't stop it. And I thought that was outrageous for us British vo uh, voters and, and ratepayers to be uh, dumped with a, a, such an incredibly destructive system that we didn't ask for. So I decided to find out who made decisions on nuclear weapons. And um, everybody said, you're, you're nuts. I mean, you can't possibly. So I said, well, let's start with China. That must be the most difficult wrong. Uh, the most difficult was France, actually. Um, <laughs> Not many, maybe. Not many. <laughs> um, but I managed to accumulate a very small group of six researchers, each a specialist from one of the countries. And in four years, we published our first book, which was called How Nuclear Weapons Decisions Are Made, with wiring diagrams showing how the intelligence community influenced the warhead development labs and how they were arms, the missile producers influence what kind of weapons the military would have and so on. And um, it was published and there was um, a, a deadly silence from the Ministry of Defense in, in Britain who eventually um, banned us from talking to any of the military in Britain. Um, partly because what we wanted to do was to bring those policymakers to meet their opposite numbers from other countries and to meet their <coughs> informed critics, uh, people who'd been in the business and had retired, like Professor Frank Barnaby, who had been a warhead designer at Aldermaston in Britain, and then decided ethically that it was the wrong thing to do, and is now, or then became, the director of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. So it was those kind of people. And initially, it was a terrible failure because nobody wanted to talk to us. Um, it was a very close shop. And it took me a while to realize, and some good advice from Quakers, I became a Quaker about that time, uh, who said to me, you're, I, people who you're trying to talk to can feel your anger and your fear. So I had to deal with that. As we know, mediators have to deal with their own emotions. And it was only through a lot of learning to meditate with the Quakers and so on, and people, good friends, putting me th you know, through my paces, that I gradually reached a place where I could see the nuclear policy makers as people, not as what they were doing. I could separate. And then the meeting started to happen. I don't want to detract from the meeting. I want to um, step back for one moment and ask, because for a lot of people, uh, as you point out in your book, uh, ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And I suppose corollary is extraordinary people can do extraordinary things too. Um, but how did you get to that uh, conversation about nuclear disarmament from where you began? How do people listening to you uh, take uh, comfort in the sense that this is possible from an ordinary starting point to an extraordinary conversation? How did you make that journey? Um, I, I, whereas I think it depends on your passion. Um, this is why when young people come along to me now and say, 
the world's in a real mess. I'm, I'm terrified of the future. What can I do? I say to them, what breaks your heart? And that's what matters for a young person. What breaks your heart? So is it refugee children? Is it injured animals? Whatever it is, name what breaks your heart. Second question, what are your skills? Are you good at social media? Are you good at crowdfunding? Are you good at gathering people around you? OK, marry your skills with your passion. And in my case, it was I loved doing research, but I also was passionately interested in what made people tick. And I married that with my what was breaking my heart, which was the likelihood of nuclear war. And so the two married. And, um, so for and you, it wasn't a huge leap. For you, it was a natural step. More or less. And, and, and gathering around me a group of people who none of us knew anything about nuclear weapons when we started, but who were keen to learn and were passionate <coughs> and were committed. Uh, paid almost nothing. At the beginning, there was not, no, no funding. And we just had to do it out of, actually, um, I just used all my savings to, to, to start with. I interrupted your path, though. You were talk, telling us a little bit about bringing these sides together and the, the power of that connection. Please continue. Well, it, this is where it comes close to what you're all expert in in this room, which is how do you mediate people who are coming from totally opposite directions? And I was lucky enough to be invited to Beijing uh, in 1986, in the middle of the Cold War. And uh, I said to some of the, um, there were people involved in international communications, and ultimately I got to meet some of the military and some of the physicists. And I said, would you be willing to come to Oxford in a delegation? And so they brought a delegation to Oxford, and we took them to St. Anthony's College. I don't know if any of you know <coughs> Oxford, but um, it's, it's the College for International Relations, and the auditorium was absolutely full, packed, because Chinese military delegations don't, or in those days, never. And so I was sitting in, in quite a, dis I was chairing it, and quite a discussion developed between the Chinese military and the British military. And it was getting a little hotter <coughs> in the room. And uh, people weren't listening to each other. It was just an argument. And so at some point, I said, gentlemen, we've heard such interesting facts put on the table. Can we please take three minutes in complete silence to simply let those facts land with us to absorb what we've heard. And somewhat to my surprise, complete silence fell. And um, at that moment, I knew, especially when we resumed and the whole conversation was different, I knew that there was this, the undercurrent that had to start to um, the undercurrent of what was really happening in the room had to begin to mesh with what was the arguments that were being made. Um, and you will know that so well. Thank you. I'm, I'm keen on developing some specific examples mm -hmm. of things that you've either experienced directly or uh, cohorts have, have developed uh, along your, with you. Um, in your book, you talk about this example of a, just a moment in time of conflict involving an American soldier. And I'd like to describe that to the audience because it resonated for me as the power of being in the moment and, and it, it, I'll let you describe it, please. Well, this, this moved me to tears. It was reported in the New Yorker, I think. Lieutenant Colonel Chris Hughes, three months after the American invasion of Iraq, was leading his men when you still could lead a foot patrol down the street, down the street in Najaf. And all of a sudden, out of both sides of the street, the mosques and the, and the side streets, came extremely angry men, shouting, yelling, waving their fists, and screaming at these young soldiers who had no idea what they were saying because they didn't speak Arabic. 
and Lieutenant Colonel Hughes strode into the middle of the whole thing with his weapon pointed at the ground and gave his men an order they had never heard in their lives. Kneel! And these heavily armed young soldiers wobbled to the ground with their backpacks and their helmets and their the weapons into the sand. And complete silence. And after two or three minutes, everybody went home. Now there's two key elements to this story which you spotted immediately. The first was the presence of mind of that young officer. He was able in a flash to see that a massacre was in the making and he knew what to do. And that's the second point, is that what he ordered his men to do was a gesture of respect a simple, undeniable gesture of respect. And what he knew is what we've now been able to unravel, which is that humiliation is one of the biggest drivers of conflict and the fastest <coughs> antidote to humiliation is respect. Perfect. Thank you. Um, other examples? in the book that caught my attention. You've done quite a bit of work with women, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. But an example of, of the young schoolgirl in the Mideast, that uh, um, was such a powerful story in the book. Could you, could you touch on that too, please? Yeah, well, she's, she's Gululai Ismail. She lives in the Swat Valley in northwest Pakistan, which is probably one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a woman. And she started aged 15, when I first met her, getting girls into school. Along with her colleague Malala Yousafzai, who you will know because she won the Nobel Peace Prize, who got shot in the head for doing exactly that. Well, Gulunai, undeterred, she's one of the bravest people I've ever met, um, went on to develop and train teams of young men and young women to go into the madrasas. You know what a madrasa is? It's a school where, uh, a relig religious school. And in this case, in northwestern Pakistan, where young men were being trained for jihad. And what these young teams of young people did was to go with the young men who were being trained for jihad back to their families and sit down and discuss with the parents why the Qur'an would not approve of suicide bombing. And they have so far dissuaded 203 young men from carrying out suicide bombings. Now, if that's not conflict prevention, I don't know what it is. <laughs> and when you think of the people who are alive now because of what those kids did not do. Um, and so, well, you mentioned Peace Direct earlier, which is the organization I set up in 2002. Because we had done a survey, I, I, from having worked with nuclear weapons, I handed on all that work to my colleagues who are much better at it than I was, and started to become aware of what was happening at the other end of the scale of violence, namely at the grassroots. Because um, I had a hunch that people were taking local conflicts into their own hands um, and dealing with them. And in many cases, risking their lives to do that. So I asked a young researcher to find out, this was in 1999, how many such locally led peace initiatives existed in the world. And he was able to track down 350, which matched our criteria of accountability um, measuring and monitoring what they were doing. And um, we, we were able to identify these 350. We did the same exercise last year, and the number is now 1,650. So that phenomenon is growing like this. It's like green shoots coming up through concrete. So when people tell me that the world is becoming a more dangerous place, that is really only now true of the um, in terms of actual uh, battle casualties. Um, and 
we are being encouraged by the media to, uh, to feel a lot more fear than is really useful in this day and age. Um, we, we have the opportunity to look much more deeply into how conflicts at the sharp end are being resolved. And, and um, that's what these heroes of mine are, are doing. They're the bravest people I've ever met in my life. And an observation about some of these brave people, they're doing what they're doing with minimal training, it seems. These schoolgirls in Pakistan, I'm surmising, but they didn't go through the same mediation courses that these people have taken. No. Can I, can I tell you about one in the Congo? Would you please? Um, Henri Bura Ladi was a child soldier in the Congo. You know about the Congo conflict. It's lasted for six or seven years, killed six million people, but nobody even remembers it now. And it's still going on. Henri was a child soldier. He managed to escape, and he walked through the bush for three days with no food and water, and eventually was received in a place called the Center for Resolution of Conflicts, a French, French organized um, outfit. And he was de-traumatized there. He, they cared for him and helped him get over what he'd been through. And he decided to devote the rest of his life to freeing other child soldiers. So now, when my organization sends him a very small amount of money, $100, he gets on his motorbike, rides into the bush, and buys a herd of goats. And he drives the goats to where the militia are hiding. And that in itself is risking his life, because the media are trigger happy, they're high on drugs, and they don't like strangers. But Henri knows how to talk to them. So he bargains one goat, price $5 for one child. And he takes the children home to their families. And that's when the hard work begins, as you all know. Because when people have been through that kind of trauma, these kids have been taught to kill by being sent into their own villages with an automatic weapon to shoot people. That's the boys, and the girls have been sex slaves. So these kids are probably more highly traumatized than you can imagine. And they've found such ingenious ways of enabling the kids to be re-accepted by their communities. Because the communities reject them, they think they're monsters. Back. The temptation is to follow these threads, and we could all afternoon. I, I want to get just a couple more examples out of those that would stimulate the thinking. Your book is replete with the importance of getting more women involved in conflict resolution. Will you touch on that thing for a moment, please? And I think it's really important because um, when UNIFEM, the United Nations uh, Organization for Women, measured how many what was the percentage of females at peace negotiations? And they found it to be 3.5% of those sitting around peace tables were women in 2009. And they then set up um, teams to encourage more women. And they, were, they found that when, if the um, percentage of women went up just to 10% around the tables, the peace agreements reached lasted 15, time, uh, 15 years longer than they would have done before. Most peace agreements collapsed in five years. And when women were more present, they lasted 20 years. So that what they um, learned was that when women were there, they were able to represent the interests of the victims of the war. <coughs> interests would otherwise not have been taken into consideration, namely the maimed, the bereaved, uh, the uh, widows particularly, and the soldiers returning with PT PTSD. So when, it, when these issues weren't taken into consideration, the peace agreements fell apart because people weren't behind them and um, the struggles re-emerged. But when women were there and insisting, 
um, they lasted that much longer. So their aim now, it's now called UN Women, is to get 50% of negotiators and mediators to be female. Uh, with the encouragement that women from every country where there is conflict to put forward the biographies of women who would be capable and able to sit at the table. Because main, most governments or factions will say, we haven't got any women who are competent, which is nonsense. So inclusive security in Washington, D.C., led by uh, your former ambassador to Hungary, uh, is doing a fabulous job bringing the biographies of capable women into full recognition to be at the peace table. Thank you for that important observation. <coughs> Hard to imagine the conversations between the governance of the United States and North Korea looking the same if there were two women leaders engaged in that. <laughs> Just an observation. Let's talk for a moment about um, some of the specific skill sets that you and others um, like you bring to the table. Because in reading your book, it, I've got to say, it <coughs> reads a little bit like a primer for mediators, to be quite honest. The value of listening and the value of some of the things we discussed this morning. Uh, talk to me about what some of those attributes are. Maybe the, the easiest or hardest place to start would be how friends of yours might describe you. What kind of characteristics do you bring to your efforts to build peace that you think have served you well over the years? Well, actually, the outline document that you gave me before we, when we met before is, is really going to be the primer. Your notes, you, he's written four pages of notes, which to me are the basis for the best possible primer for this kind of work. I'm serious about this because um, I only know it from, from really one perspective. But bearing in mind what I've said so far, I think the first one is, is the ability to listen. And um, we all think we're good listeners. When I ask a big room full of people to raise their hand if they feel they're a good listener, most hands go up. After we've done a 45-minute exercise, and I ask them the same thing, people are much more hesitant, because we really, most of the time, don't give the other person our full attention. And so listening, I think, is, is the biggest one. Um, and it allows, in the exercise that we do, it allows the attention to go from the brain, which always says, I'm right and you're wrong, to the heart that begins to say, is that how you feel? And once we begin to feel what the other person's feeling, um, something shifts and a possibility emerges. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you, everybody in this room knows more about that than I do. So. Still uh, near and dear to all of our hearts and worthy of a moment of conversation. I mean, in mediation training, even with experienced mediators, we give lip service to the uh, need for effective listening. We often call it listening without judgment. But we now know that listening without judgment is impossible from a neurobiological perspective. The best we can do is suspend judgment, listen with curiosity, listen for the congruence of words and body language, a deeper level of listening that really is about listening with your whole being. And so I think we all have lessons to learn still about it. And maybe you can describe for a moment your experience with the French uh, perfume manufacturer, but that was an interesting story as well. Actually, the biggest luxury goods purveyor for women in the world, and probably the most CEO uh, tracked me down after watching the TED Talk that you mentioned. And uh, she said, I'm going to introduce a program of active and conscious leadership for our global presidents, of whom there are 25, mostly French aristocrats who knew everything there was to know about perfume and, and cosmetics and beautiful clothes, um, and were highly self-confident. Um, so I had to introduce them to uh, a little exercise to see if they could even listen to each other, because there was a lot of friction in the company and a lot of quarrelsomeness. And um, at the beginning, they, they were, the body language was unbelievable. <laughs> of course, 
course, we know how to listen. I mean, everybody can listen. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, well, could you please um, put your chairs opposite, uncross your legs, give your partner your full attention, and keep eye contact for five <coughs> minutes while your partner speaks without nodding. Nodding? What is nodding? Um, of course we don't nod. Um, I said, well, you're just watching, you're fine. You do. Um, and nodding, of course, is unconsciously giving the other person an encouragement in a certain direction. So, anyway, there was a lot of acting out. And, and for the first round, um, five minutes each way. And we progressed through it somehow or another. And by the end of it, I asked them, do you really think you know how to listen? They went, and pulled faces. Anyway, we did this for um, two, uh, two separate mornings of the conference <coughs> for um, 45 minutes each time. And eventually they said, this works. And so they asked me to introduce it to the next 200 executives and the next 400 at a different level. And eventually, they said, what you taught us enables us to resolve in 15 minutes what would have taken four hours and still not been resolved. So that company has taken this into its, into its uh, DNA and into its um, daily um, relational practice. And they've even come up now with the, the concepts like, Vulnerability is a good idea and safe to fail. So they're, they're taking on a different culture now. As I listen to your fabulous example, I think you may have still dodged my question, albeit our thing, <laughs> which is how a friend of yours might describe you in particular <laughs> and the characteristics you bring. Because I've just met you, and certainly one of the words that comes to mind to me is courage, the courage you have <coughs> to move forward in the face of lots of adversity. But give me other other words that either describe you or, if necessary, other people around you who have been successful in applying dispute resolution skills in a variety of contexts. Self-reflection being an important part of this. <laughs> um, I, I think um, I'm, I'm fascinated with developing what I would call the helicopter view of myself. In other words, having an observer, my own, my own observer, that watches what I do and observe when I'm acting out or when I'm um, showing off or when I'm um, doing something which is not helpful to the process. So I think that's, that's one of, I think having a meditation practice of some kind, some kind of self-knowledge, fairly regular, if possible, daily discipline of quiet self-inspection, if I can. I really think it's vital. Because otherwise, unconsciously, I'm, I'm projecting out some emotion or other. And that can get totally in the way of any resolution that I'm trying to engender and interfere with it, and not least with colleagues. I mean, me and my colleagues have tremendously deep and difficult sortings out of our own, our own inability to understand each other. So it's an ongoing, an ongoing work in progress, I would say. And one thing we can all learn from you amongst many is for people who are passionate and driven and busy, what do you do for self-care? Mm -hmm. What do you do to continue to tap into a wellspring of energy that serves you so well in these pursuits? Um, I have a garden. Um, I live in, in the Cotswolds. It's in the south of England. And um, when I came to live there, I noticed a big high wall and I went and opened the door, and it was like the secret garden. Was ever, anybody ever read that story when you were little? And it was all totally overgrown, and there was in one corner there was an old man digging. And I said to him, can anybody have a piece of ground here? And he said, yeah, if you clear the weeds, you can. 
So I went and found a south-facing wall and dug myself a, a, a four square yards, and then next year another four square yards, a bit of colonial expansion. And, <laughs> <laughs> and now I have, um, I have a nice vegetable garden and a greenhouse. And so to answer your question, that's the ground is my nourishment. The earth, going out, getting filthy, not minding what I look like, what I sound like, just listening to the birds. That's to bring this part of the conversation to a conclusion, not the least of our opportunities, I'm sure everyone. Um, you have a unique opportunity this coming weekend, which is to meet the First Minister. And through John's good offices, obviously, <coughs> for that opportunity as, as many. Um, what do you think about as you approach that opportunity? What seeds do you hope to do? Even John is nervous about it. <laughs> 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 so, so please, that's why I raised the issue now. We're giving plenty of time. <laughs> what thoughts do you uh, have as you approach that meeting? What what seeds do you perhaps hope to uh, sow in that opportunity? Well, I, I hope to benefit from our conversations over the next two days because I'll, I'll be around for most of the next two days, and and we'll definitely have a conversation with John because I would value whatever you feel you'd like to put forward to her. Um, I was born in Scotland, and I love Scotland, and um, I'm not totally in favor of independence for Scotland, but I do feel that there are ways in which Scotland could become the, the heart of um, a movement to uh, replace the current methods of diplomacy and the efforts to resolve conflicts with high-skilled mediation. And I would love to see Edinburgh become the hub of such training with all your help. Um, I think that would be a wonderful claim to fame for the country. Um, and, um, and also, we're in the midst of the most horrible, messy negotiations with the EU, as you know. And we're doing it in such an unskilled way. And um, I just wish that um, we had put in place much more support for our political leaders by people like yourself with your kind of training. Because I believe that every political leader, when they come into office, should be surrounded by good, strong people who will keep them honest and keep keep them keep away the influences and lobbyists who want to divert them into very bad decisions. So um, I, I believe, having talked to you both and learned a bit about the, this international academy, that what you what you are developing. Is, is going to be seen as uh, n a normal education in 20 years. I think it should be part of school education, part of university education, that everybody should learn these skills because it will, it will diminish family fights, it will diminish horrific legal processes, it will diminish pain. And that that's what I would love to see. And maybe Scotland could take a lead on that, since this is where we are. Mm -hmm. right. A brilliant place to lead the conversation for the moment. Thank you so much. is really involve the rest of you in a broader conversation about things that might be achievable for all of us within our own communities or regions. And so I'm going to ask people to stay at the tables or within the groups that they're in at the moment to answer a couple questions that we'll put up on the board. But essentially they're designed to try and get a list of specific ideas about what projects people are already involved with 
in their own community. I'll give you some examples to stimulate thinking in a moment. And other ideas people have about projects that maybe they could get involved with. The idea being, of course, to help inspire each other. And if we can get a scribe at each table for the purpose of making sure we have some written accumulation of those thoughts, what we'll do at the conclusion of this program with John and Brenny and others' uh, efforts, we'll make sure we get that list uh, assembled and out to people. Okay? That's going to be about the next 15 or 20 minutes of our program before we come back together and talk a little bit about what that means and then how do we, how do we translate those kind of ideas into action. Those of you who know me know I'm a, a practical sort of heart and the goal is to try and figure out what we do to turn those ideas into action. So um, to stimulate thinking, uh, since uh, I challenged you and myself five years ago, uh, I've done a number of things, started the online mediation training program with my wife and others to develop uh, lessons for people uh, to access around the globe. Um, we're in the process of trying to formulate a group of uh, uh, individuals with a host of 100 uh, international fellows coming from our organization in different countries to try and access projects that they can uh, make use of uh, locally, bringing their conflict resolution talents to bear and local and regional problems around the globe. And a number of other ideas that people around me uh, have, have exam given examples of, like this, the Daniel Bowling example a few minutes ago. So come together in your groups, talk about things that people are doing now. If I could ask uh, the folks in the back to put on the screen those, uh, the next slide that has the three questions I'd like you to address internally. And then we'll come back together and we'll take a snapshot of some of the, some of the ideas. We'll have a chance to hopefully hear a little bit more from uh, Dr. Elwood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I a while ago as, during my lovely interview because I could tell from the audience attention uh, that uh, you were going to learn much more and remember much more from our conversation and listening to uh, Dr. Elworthy than listening to me. So I truncated the conversation uh, we're going to wrap up shortly. If I could just ask for the next slide to be presented. Uh, what I've done is, in my sort of pragmatic fashion, is try and help give a blueprint for next steps for those that are motivated. And it should be uplinked on our website, uh, edwardsmediationacademy.com, by this afternoon, if it's not already. It'll be under the blog section entitled, um, uh, Turning Ideas into Action, Reflections from Edinburgh. And it really is an expansion of all of these uh, uh, important concepts from my standpoint on how do you take all of these conversation points and really uh, turn them into concrete next steps. Uh, one of the ironies, of course, in, in what we do is developing uh, the concept of looking inward and recognizing that it's our ability to develop our own personal capacity that allows us really to help others. And whether that personal capacity is, is one of self-awareness and managing our ego, our ability to perceive our own emotions, and sort of what we come from historically in terms of emotional experience, building empathy, as we discussed, certainly listening, a, a, a recurrent theme in this conversation, and mindfulness techniques to pursue focused attention, all of which reflect the mediator's mind. The mediator's mind being a concept that I talk about often that influences all of our interventions regardless of how we attempt to, to intervene. It influences the words we use, it influences the process we help design, it influences all of these different capacities. Um, but for a more developed conversation around these points, go to the white paper that's on the blog. You don't need to listen to me articulate things that are probably much better said in writing. Could I have the last slide, please? Okay. So once you've developed your inner capacity to its fullest extent, as uh, Dr. Elworthy said earlier, then the question is, how do you identify your intervention? To use her words, you find your passion. You find that thing in life that breaks your heart. And then you reflect on your skill set. What do you have to offer? Presumably everybody in this room has mediation skills, but beyond that, you have more. And then you need to uh, bridge those uh, passions with those skills uh, to really develop uh, the intervention. Toward that goal, there's a number of uh, specific steps. 
uh, defining the focus as a conversation about whether it's that local project in the church versus a broader project involving uh, uh, sustainability, wind farms and the like, and, and conversations with property owners. Which of those fits your skill set? Um, <clears throat> identifying key relationships, understanding issues at hand, uh, we often find and, and talk about in commercial mediation that we don't have to be experts in particular substantive areas. But my uh, supposition is that as we move into uh, broader societal conflicts, a deeper knowledge of those conflicts, including the culture in which they arise, is an important attribute that we bring to the conversation. Identifying all the potential stakeholders speaks for itself. Uh, there's lots of examples of uh, folks that have failed and tripped out of the starting blocks because they haven't engaged all the appropriate stakeholders in a dispute. And then uh, <clears throat> developing uh, the roadmap, meaning uh, de devising a business plan and, and, and ensuring sustainability. Too often a lot of these noble efforts fail because from the beginning uh, we parachute in and we think that we're going to be welcomed with open arms, when in fact the opposite is true. Conflict partners need to know that we're there for the duration, that we're buying into that dispute and really going to help carry them along the way. So that, that requires sustainability uh, in your uh, roadmap. And ultimately, applying your proven mediation skills. As I've said in this white paper, who better than to carry this message forward than those people who have walked into a room a thousand times or five thousand times and been the only one in that room to appreciate that resolution is possible, but you. You're the ones who do that day in and day out. You can bring that same sense of purpose and enthusiasm and conviction to these non-commercial disputes. So I do encourage you to read the white paper that is uh, a much more uh, developed conversation around these bullet points. I hope you'll appreciate that I borrowed extra time to uh, uh, share with you the wisdom of our guest. And I'm just going to bring uh, to a head the last quote from her book that really sort of touched me as I read it. But uh, my wife and I have often said to our children that sort of the measure of life is going to be uh, how you treat other people and what you do for other people, particularly those less fortunate. And then I, I read in uh, Dr. Elworthy's book that um, there's some research done on the qualities of 21st century leaders and the highest level of consciousness is service to others. It's described as selfless service in pursuit of your passion, your purpose, or vision. And in seeking ways to resolve conflict in service to others, Dr. Elworthy writes, in this way, you will become robust as well as empathetic, courageous as well as sensitive, resilient at the same time as being full of grace. In short, you will become a noble person in service to your community and the world. So thank you to our honored guests. Silla said about having that helicopter view of yourself, but I'd like to, you just to think about for a second from your helicopter vantage point is about how Bruce Edwards handled this, yeah. about the way in which he engaged in the conversation with Silla, about the very different approach Tolan Pashney brought to that last very, very full segment. Mm -hmm. I'd like you especially to think about the way in which Silla Elworthy Herself. She talks about the helicopter that she might use to, to consider herself. Let us consider what we saw, what we heard, how it came across, and why it was so effective. Mm -hmm. And if our word for this session, our word is selfless service, I think we have here a selfless service. And I would like to present the first of our international <laughs> mediator, Tartan Sashes, to our distinguished guest, Anna Pro. Thank you so much for